content warning for this episode. This podcast contains sensitive subject matter discussing suicide, personal experiences, and detailed medical descriptions that aren't suitable for all audiences. I want to start today with a few lines of poetry. The poem is about the Golden Gate Bridge, and it starts like this. At last, the mighty task is done, resplendent in the western sun. The bridge looms mountain high, its titan piers grip ocean floor, its great steel arms link shore with shore, its towers pierce the sky. On its broad deck, in rightful pride, the world in swift parade shall ride. Those are the opening lines of The Mighty Task is Done by Joseph Strauss. He wrote the poem to celebrate his greatest triumph, the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge. Joseph was an engineer and poet who had devoted 20 years of his life to making the Golden Gate a reality. Finally, on May 27, 1937, his goal was realized. The Golden Gate Bridge was opened to the public. Hundreds of thousands participated in the week-long Golden Gate Bridge Fiesta. On day one, more than 200,000 people paid 25 cents each to walk the bridge. The following day, all the way across the country in the White House, President Franklin Roosevelt pressed a telegraph key and the bridge was officially open for vehicular use. The Golden Gate was a cause for celebration, but that would soon change. Ten weeks later, 47-year-old World War I veteran Harold Wauber walked onto the bridge. He struck up a conversation with a college professor who was vacationing and taking in the views from the new bridge. As they walked and talked, Harold slipped off his coat and vest, handed them to the professor and said, this is where I get off. Then he vaulted over the four-foot railing and fell to his death. His body was never found. For 20 years, Harold had been suffering from shell shock, a form of PTSD that had followed him home from his service in World War I. By the time Joseph Strauss died, a mere nine months after Harold jumped, six people had ended their lives by jumping from the bridge. For many, the bridge was becoming more than just an iconic landmark. It was becoming an ever-present reminder of loved ones lost. This is Death Becomes Her, and I'm your host, Lyella Kelly. Before we go any further, once again, today's episode is about suicide, and there are some very graphic parts. If this is a topic that you're not comfortable with for any reason, please stop listening now. Bob McGee is a painter. He has spent countless hours spreading a color known as International Orange over the steel skeleton of the famed Golden Gate Bridge, protecting it from the salty air, wind, and fog that characterize the San Francisco Bay. He recalls an incident from May 2004. He says that a man with long hair was sitting on the outer rail. He says, from my vantage point, he appeared to look calm, perched on the rail with his back to us casually talking on a cell phone. After watching him for several minutes, I doubted his intention to jump, having had plenty of time to contemplate his inevitable fate if he jumped. I figured wrong. I looked away for just a moment. I was shocked by the splash and the sound that followed, which I can only liken to a shotgun blast. My body cringed from this sick sound, an unforgettable sound, a sound that told me this man's body had been broken in so many ways. Undoubtedly, this man did not survive. I closed my eyes knowing, at that exact second, I had witnessed a death. He went on to explain, if you work at the Golden Gate Bridge long enough, you have probably seen at least one person go over the outer rail heard a splash from someone hitting the water, or seen the body of an unfortunate jumper floating in the bay. But to witness an entire jump is a rare occurrence, something like being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Bob, and many others, like the vacationing professor who held Harold Wabber's coat and vest, have inadvertently become intertwined with the sad history of suicides on the Golden Gate. 
people in the wrong place at the wrong time, sucked into a story they never meant to be a part of. It is estimated that over 2,000 people have jumped from the bridge. The exact number is unknown. Many jumps have been witnessed, but many have not. It's impossible to know how many have jumped unseen in the night, their bodies washed out to sea. Additionally, transparency around the number of deaths is intentionally murky. Authorities no longer publish the numbers, and newspapers and TV stations no longer report on the deaths. This is because the Golden Gate Bridge has been characterized as a cluster location. Epidemiologist and Columbia University suicide prevention expert Madeline Gold explains, One person's suicide facilitates the occurrence of another. A stimulus influences subsequent deaths. Basically, suicide can be contagious. Take, for example, the suicide of Marilyn Monroe. The Center for Suicide Prevention reports Marilyn's controversial death is often cited as a quintessential case of this copycat effect. There was a rise in suicides by as much as 12% during the month after her death. That wasn't an isolated occurrence. Subsequent studies saw similar parallels between confirmed suicides of celebrities and the ensuing news coverage, as well as coverage of non-celebrities who died by suicide. Regrettably, similar scenarios have played out time and time again, a person's suicide becoming romanticized and ultimately imitated. The quote-unquote romance is a concern for beautiful, famous places that inadvertently become suicide magnets. Places like the Empire State Building, the Eiffel Tower, or Niagara Falls. Gold, quoted earlier, says that suicide is often depicted in a way that is too appealing. Dr. Mel Blastine, chair of the Golden Gate Bridge Barrier Task Force, comments, Suicide on the Golden Gate Bridge is very painful. It looks like a quick death. That's a mistake. It's very slow. We're going to talk about that for a bit. The reality of suicide and the Golden Gate. If you were to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge, you would see a number of non-physical measures designed to deter people from committing suicide on the bridge. These non-physical measures include 11 yellow emergency and crisis call boxes located on the sidewalks that can connect people to trained suicide prevention counselors. There's surveillance combined with bicycle patrols, motor patrols, and bridge workers trained to detect persons exhibiting suicidal behaviors. Passing drivers also may be of assistance by reporting activity as they travel across the bridge. Through the use of these measures, currently approximately 70% of suicide attempts are prevented. But what if someone does jump? What happens then? As mentioned earlier, this isn't a beautiful, soaring, peaceful death. The drop will take four seconds. The impact with the water will occur at 75 to 80 miles per hour, 15,000 pounds of force per square inch. Jumpers will likely suffer some combination of broken sternum, clavicle, pelvis, neck, or skull. Broken ribs splintering inward, tearing the spleen, lungs, or heart, snapping vertebrae, and rupturing the liver. Some will die on impact from multiple blunt force trauma. Others, who are less fortunate, may drown in their own blood or the seawater, or perhaps from hypothermia. Death can take seconds or minutes. The body may not be located. Strong currents may sweep a body into eddies and out to the sea, where crabs will eat the soft parts like eyeballs and cheeks, while sharks eat the rest. The body vanishing forever. Family and friends never knowing the fate. Many, I hesitate to call them the lucky ones, will be recovered. If a jump is witnessed, the sailors of the U.S. Coast Guard at Fort Baker will spring into action. Within four to five minutes of the call, they will race the boat to the approximate location of the jumper. If retrieval is successful, CPR will be performed until the dock is reached. If prudent, life-sustaining measures will then stop. The broken corpse will be brought to shore in a long, shallow container covered by a yellow tarp. Any recovered belongings will be placed with the body. When the coroner investigator and the highway patrol arrive, they will discuss what is known and unknown. Things like identity of the victim, witnesses to the jump, suicide note, whether or not a car was left in the area that may contain additional evidence. 
The body will be released to a contracted funeral home, and a pathologist will coordinate to perform the autopsy. In the meantime, officers will track down and notify next of kin, preferably in person. This process plays out every time a jump is witnessed. All of the professionals, as well as any number of people in the wrong place at the wrong time, will be pulled into the wake of this tragedy. The emotional toll is heavy. One young officer said, I didn't sign up for this. I joined the Coast Guard to save lives. Guard spokesman Roger Gaiman says, it takes a special breed of person to deal with the physical horrors of death. He says it's a very touchy thing. These people see a lot of death, and it's not easy for them to talk about. No doubt you will agree that everything we've talked about so far is horrifying, from the brutality of the death to how many people will carry emotional scars in the aftermath of the jump. Maybe you're wondering, like I was, if suicides became a nearly instantaneous part of Golden Gate history, why hasn't anything been done to deter jumpers? Yes, there are the non-physical deterrents like the patrols and the call boxes mentioned earlier, but what about a physical way to keep people from jumping? That seems to be a good question considering that way back in 1939, just two years after the bridge opened, the California Highway Patrol began calling for a physical suicide barrier. Over the next 70 years, many other individuals and groups pled for the bridge district to erect a barrier to prevent suicides. Numerous studies were conducted, but in the end, the findings were ignored and recommendations to construct a suicide barrier on the bridge were defeated. Many question why a group would ignore potentially life-saving recommendations. It brings to mind a couple more lines from the poem written by Engineer Strauss. An honored cause and nobly fought, and that which they so bravely wrought, now glorifies their deed, no selfish urge shall stain its life, nor envy, greed, intrigue, nor strife, nor false ignoble creed. Did you catch the part about no selfish urges or greed? Those lines stuck out to me in light of the bits that I'm going to share next. The original designs for the bridge actually called for a railing higher than four feet, specifically to prevent suicides. However, the railing was lowered to four feet to enhance the view. Okay, maybe that was an unfortunate oversight, but it doesn't necessarily make anyone selfish or greedy, does it? Consider what one of the arguments against the physical suicide barrier have been throughout the decades. Time and time again, it has been argued that a physical barrier will mar the beauty of the bridge. Some would say that argument places aesthetics above human life, and some might think that a bit selfish or greedy, but you draw your own conclusions. Other arguments, as you may have guessed, have been about money. Some call spending money on a physical barrier wasteful, saying that 30 suicides a year doesn't justify the cost of a net. Does that argument hold water? Here's the technical stuff. Each witnessed Golden Gate Bridge jump requires mobilizing staff, vehicles, watercraft, and aircraft. The suicide recovery attempt to rescue an individual who has jumped from the bridge requires coordinated efforts by bridge patrol, highway patrol, and the U.S. Coast Guard boats, not including helicopter searches, over at least two hours at a minimal cost of approximately $10,600 per incident. At 30 suicides per year, the cost of recovery attempts alone is $318,000 which is $6.36 million over 20 years. Studies have been done that have considered all of these financial aspects as well as the dollar amount placed on our individual human lives. One such study entitled Analysis of the Cost-Effectiveness of a Suicide Barrier on the Golden Gate Bridge determined, quote, Cost-benefit analysis suggests that a suicide barrier on the Golden Gate Bridge would result in a highly cost-effective reduction in suicide mortality in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
The World Health Organization analysis agreed, saying the barrier would pass the WHO cost-effectiveness threshold less than nine months after construction. So we have aesthetics versus public safety, cost-benefit analysis in favor of a physical barrier, and this one, which is the big one. Would a physical barrier really work? Would it save lives? A study in the Lancet Psychiatry found that installing suicide barriers can reduce the number of deaths by more than 90% at high-risk locations. Studies compared physical barriers and non-physical interventions like encouraging help-seeking and encouraging the likelihood of third-party interventions like training bridge staff to spot potential self-harm. Out of the three, suicide barriers were the most effective. The findings make sense when you consider that impulsivity is frequently involved in suicides. Dr. Jerome Motto, psychiatrist and suicide expert, says that jumping from the bridge is seen as sure, quick, clean, and available, which is the most potent factor. It's like having a loaded gun on your kitchen table. Kevin Hines knows this all too well. He jumped from the Golden Gate and survived. He broke an ankle and two vertebrae, and in a really crazy twist, was kept afloat by a sea lion until he was rescued. He described his jump as instant regret. 34 others have also survived the jump and echoed Kevin's feeling that they regretted their decision as soon as they jumped. Easy access combined with impulsivity is a recipe for disaster. So what about the Golden Gate Bridge? What's going to happen? In 2008, 71 years and well over a thousand suicides later, the Golden Gate Bridge District approved the addition of a net on the underside of the bridge. 10 years later, in 2018, net construction finally began. The net is placed 20 feet below the sidewalk, extending 20 feet out from the bridge. The design allows open, scenic vistas to remain intact while preventing anyone from easily jumping to the water below. The net will have minimal impacts to the architecture of the structure. It will be painted the same international orange color as the bridge. At long last, the net is expected to be completed this month. This has been a pretty deep, sometimes gruesome dive. It wasn't on my list of things to talk about, but that changed back in November when I was sitting in a waiting room. The man next to me was talking on his phone with no attempt to keep his conversation private. He said something that we should all keep in mind. These are his words. The holidays are kind of rough on me, but I can call the crisis line or call the hospital. I don't know anything else about this man but his words stuck with me. While researching this episode, I learned that in spite of the oft-repeated statistic that suicide rates are higher around the holidays, it simply isn't true. Historically, December rates actually tend to be lower than other months. But that's really a moot point. People are hurting every day, every week, and every month of the year. For some, like the man I was next to in the waiting room, it seems that the holidays do trigger difficult emotions. He's not an oddity. No doubt many will struggle through the holidays, sad, hopeless, alone, and perhaps a bit impulsive. But whatever the season, we can do our part. It's easy to be self-sparing and to look away or explain away signs of distress. But we can learn lessons from the Golden Gate. Be proactive. Don't make it easy for people to slip through the cracks. Check in on people. Don't assume someone else will reach out to them. On the contrary, assume you're the only one who will reach out to them. Educate yourself. Learn about the risk factors, both emotional and environmental. Learn the warning signs and familiarize yourself with the resources available in your area. Visit the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention at AFSP.org. If you're in distress, the 988 Lifeline provides 24-7 free and confidential support as well as prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. All you have to do is dial 988. If you prefer text, 
Text HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741741 from anywhere in the United States, anytime. A live trained crisis counselor receives the text and responds on a secure platform. No chatbots. As always, thank you for listening to Death Becomes Her. If you'd like to reach me, Layella Kelly, you can find me at leavingwellmt.com or DM me on Instagram. My handle is leavingwelldeathdoula. Remember, don't bottle it up. Have open, honest conversations about the tough and uncomfortable stuff. Talking about death won't kill you. I promise.